Welcome to episode five of our CPO conversation series. This week, we're joined by Nick Jenkinson, CPO at Santander UK. Nick, great to have you here. Thanks, Rich. Great to be here. Let's kick off. Why procurement? And um, maybe take us through a little bit about what you're building at Santander. So I'd love to give you a great visionary answer that I always wanted to work in procurement from a very young child. But in, in the reality is, like many people, I fell into it. Um, hmm. So I came out of uni, did an economics degree, and really didn't know what I wanted to do. Worked for a, a smaller local company who got me involved in many things, but one of the things they got me involved in is, is buying really, but then put me on to SIPs at the time and that kind of expanded my mind, expand, expanded the, the sort of scale of opportunity and then ended up looking for a sort of much bigger organization and went much, much bigger and ended up in Ford Motor Company. Um, I, mean, I think in hindsight, I think the reason why I was drawn, I think I'm very um numerate so i kind of have always enjoyed numbers i'm one of those strange people who enjoys numeric and verbal reasoning tests and and yeah, anybody yeah. Who's, anybody who's got children will also i'm sure have their kids playing time stable rock stars and i absolutely <laughs> love it and see how see how quick i can do everything so i've always had that sort of affinity with numbers and i think the other big thing is really around sort of a a natural curiosity and the challenge I always want to yeah. I always want to understand things and so obviously when I was in automotive kind of the five Y type principles and and really trying to dig into why things are happening and how do a problem solve it really kind of drew me into the profession and stayed ever since so in terms of Santander so I joined pretty much exactly two years ago I've had lots of congratulations on your work anniversary recently <laughs> on LinkedIn so um so I've really, I was, I was brought in on a interim basis to uh, effectively do a wide transformation across the organisation. So, so the bank's been going through a bank-wide transformation, focused really on becoming a, a digital-first organisation, so really changing that digital experience for both customers and colleagues, whilst also looking at improving our cost to income ratio so hmm. from a procurement perspective it was a reasonably blank sheet of paper of a we need to deliver significant value but in order to do that we obviously need to look at operating model we need to look at processes we need to look at systems so really getting into the the nuts and bolts of everything that we did and what even to the point of what is procurement what actually is yeah. procurement there to do and what's the what's the value that can be delivered so so it's been a, a very busy very exciting two years we we didn't have i was never given the benefit of transform and then deliver it was transform and deliver in parallel so it's been yeah. a challenging two years um but but very rewarding one as well and i guess you must have been busy but but what what do you do in your spare time um so so that's so, <laughs> so i would say what spare time but i'm sure if you ask, <laughs> other, ask my wife then she'll probably say something slightly different so i'm very uh i really enjoy basically sports and sports music and cooking i would say of my sort of or sports okay. music and food so uh probably got more back into playing golf when i was uh during covid actually so yeah. i was exiting previous organization and was obviously a bit more at home, had a few months off, so got back into playing golf. So I'm I'm off 12 now and uh, kind of oh, a, wow. a steady, steady 12 handicapper. Uh, football, so I'm a big Liverpool fan and, and it's kind of been a great couple of years until this season, which has been slightly <laughs> less rewarding. But um, so kind of get, get to watch them quite frequently and love holidays. I kind of love, we've got a, we have a, Family have a house in Portugal, so love getting there as much as much as we possibly can, and enjoy some sunshine. And I think outside of that, I've got two young kids, so obviously spending time with the family and and trying to um, be here and be present as much as possible. I think again, mm. what COVID showed many of us is that time is probably the most precious thing we have, and we we gained yeah. quite a lot of time back in our lives relative to. The hustle bustle of where we were previously and really trying to take advantage of that 
but also what I did start last year, which has kind of been a bit up and down and people who've seen me on LinkedIn will have seen me begging for sponsorship, but I, um, I was, I love a challenge and I'm very sort of target driven. And so during COVID, I was, I got to my lowest point in weight and then I went to my highest point in weight during lockdown. So, so kind of thought, well, I need to, to get fitter, to be healthier. And actually, how can I then raise money for some great charities as part of that? So I set myself a challenge of 20 half marathons, two endurance events and three marathons. So I'm kind of midway wow. through that at the moment and, and really on behalf of two different charities. One was for pancreatic cancer because that's what my mom died of and it's just a terrible illness. I think people who follow football and music will have seen Terry Hall and Gianluca Viali both died of it recently. Yeah, yeah. And then also the Children's Hospital in Birmingham. So my daughter about four years ago had an open heart surgery there. So again, sort of it was a, a very traumatic week for us but you do get a very um huge sense of pride in terms of what the, the hospital delivers what the nurses there deliver just the incredible job that they do on a day-to-day -day basis with some very sick children so I've raised over 5,000 so far I've had a bit of a lull so I got the I think I said to you earlier I got the uh the flu that's been going around so that's put mm. a stop to my running for a few weeks but i need to get back on that and have probably another 17 half marathons and another two marathons to do this year so so yeah that wow. should take <laughs> that should take up the rest of my spare time that's that's incredible I mean, is there much training involved as well i suppose or is, or is yeah. it the fact you're yeah, doing lots of them helps <laughs> it did but as i said i've had a bit of yeah. a time off so i just need to get back on and get motivated i was getting to a reasonable all three of my half marathons were the times improved by about two minutes in each one and then i did the three peaks and the yorkshire three peaks which again gave yeah. you some sort of good fitness training and the marathon was the best time i had done in a marathon before so it, i'm not a natural runner i would say it's not something yeah. i love um bizarrely it's it's probably the time when i do my best thinking so in a previous yeah. role one of my team used to hate me going running because he knew it meant a load of work coming his way so I would say I'm just going for a run and he would dread what the outcome was because I do think your mind gets into a very different position so mm. I kind of enjoy it when I'm there but it's more pushing myself to go out I'm sort of not the natural person who loves going to the gym on a daily basis no totally yeah I I do so I, I swim and yeah the, the 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 ideas and the the thoughts that you have while you're swimming while you're just sort of you're quite it's quite mindful in a way, but then you also get these little ideas pop into your head and you're like, that's, you know, it's, it's brilliant. They, uh, and the shower is the other one, the shower and swimming, anything to do with yeah, water yeah. sort of helps. Well, yeah, <laughs> the brain obviously goes to a very different place and you're yeah. just being able, and particularly I think with some of the longer runs, when you've got two hours of running, you obviously have a lot of time to think and other than listening yeah. to music and thinking about how far you've gone, generally lots of things come into your mind. So yeah, it is probably one of my great ideation tools as well i would say great so in terms of digitization what what's your approach to making sure new technology lands within an organization so i'm a big believer in really trying to focus on what the business problems you have i, I do think i think as a as a function gilman can be a little bit um jump from the next new thing to the next new thing and yeah. kind of a, a bit jumping on that bandwagon and I think obviously for the last, what, five years, everybody's talked about digital. Everybody's got a different definition of what digital actually means within their yeah. organization. And I do think sometimes there's been a little bit of digital for the sake of digital because yeah. it makes me, it makes, I need to do that because everybody else is doing it. And the reality is, I think you really need to focus on what's the business problem that you're trying to solve yeah. and how does that enable and then empower your users and then clearly focusing on that user experience so you need to make things really as, as simple as possible i posted something on linkedin earlier about the integrated v best of breed type approach and i actually mm -hmm. think it's a bit of a fallacy now anyway because i think the truth is that integrated solutions are not quite as integrated as they say no. on the tin is the reality yeah. because yeah. of the, the nature of how they've all been built up Secondly, there is no integrated solution that solves every problem in my business. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a result, it's really about how do you make that feel 
as seamless as possible. What your users want is a seamless journey. What the yeah. label is on what the tool is, they don't really care is the reality. What they want is simple, easy, and being able to have that se seamless end-to-end -end journey. So, which I think is a lot more complex than people think yeah. it is. I think people get hung up on technological integration, but process integration is just as critical. And it does mean that you do have to take that step back. And I think I'm quite a big believer in having a strong foundation. And then how do you breathe? How do you bring on new tools that help enable that and really add incremental value to your end to end solution? So, so really, we, that's the approach that we've taken and that we do have a core foundation with a particular source to pay technology, but we have a number of other technologies which are all adding value around that. And I guess yeah. one of the challenges we've had is how do we make this as seamless as possible, ensure that data flows effectively and, and that the process works from an end-to-end -end basis, which, which again, is, like I said, has not been an easy piece. And we are, we're definitely making some good headway. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. That is a challenge that a lot of people face. You're right in terms of the team. They're not, they don't really care what it is. There's uh, people now, I, I do hear a bit more about people care about what they don't want it to be <laughs> but yeah, yeah. You, you find quite often the from an IT point of view there's a lot of buzzwords that, that get out there and it, they get me mentioned in the magazines and then senior people will look at it and say right what we're we doing around automation or what we're we doing around AI and how we uh you know a few years ago it was cloud and you've got to take a step back from that from that hype really I think it's a really good example but um so I remember four or five years ago doing tour of India where we were looking at various PPO providers and various solutions and and I wouldn't say I'm a technology expert but I think I there's enough I understand enough about lots of different scenarios to be able to understand yeah. how the tech operates and we quite regularly were seen by some of the or sh shown by some of the providers some very very bad processes that had been automated but it was yeah. still a very bad process and so mm. that's why I think really focusing on the process and then actually mm. how do you get the technology to facilitate and enable the process is yeah. the critical thing because a bad process undertaken by a robot is still a bad process whichever yeah. way you look at it yeah, yeah. um and so yeah so that was kind of a a key aspect really so nick what is it you enjoy most about transformation so the key thing for me personally so my last four roles have all been transformation roles and and i think there's two reasons why i really enjoy it i think number one is coming back to that marathon challenge i'm quite high on the stress the performance curve to the right hand side in that yeah. i need quite a lot of stress in order to drive optimum performance which is great for me probably less great for everybody around me in, including family and and work colleagues but um i'm always the person who handed everything in one minute to go who gets the presentation done with that the morning of the of the big presentation with the CEO, et cetera, because yeah, it does drive well. that. And, and so I kind of enjoy the transformation aspect and, yeah. and particularly what we've had to do at Santander. Really, we've we've been pushing probably 18 months of uh, about what would normally take probably three, three and a half years of change into about 18 months. So it's yeah. been a very, very intense period. And then the big thing for me is around what you leave behind. It's kind of mm. the, I'm really focused on how what you create being leaving something better than what it was previously and you can yeah. and that's kind of not just viewed by me it's viewed by the whole organization it's viewed by key stakeholders it's viewed by team creating succession plans so that actually you can see three four five years later that you've created people's career paths so i think yeah. that's the bit i really enjoy about transformation activities why do you think digital transformation is so difficult so how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> so I think lots of reasons. I mean, most organizations in a large, in large organizations have a lot of legacy there. So yeah. that you have a lot of legacy that you are looking to overcome. Um, I think organizations in general, I think you've obviously got people with lots of different opinions, lots of different drivers. So I think probably most people who have tried selling 
source to pay platforms into their organization will have been through interesting conversations with architecture colleagues in terms of how does it fit into future architecture and what does that look yeah. like and and particularly when we're in on-premise world but I, I think those conversations are still just as challenging in a SaaS environment currently and I think the other key thing is is business alignment and and having that burning platform it's it's a lot lot easier where you've got a real demand from the business for a tool you've yeah. got the, the very very strong business alignment and you've got a burning platform so if i think of examples in my previous life in a pharmaceutical organization we had two different tools one was source to pay where we went from start to to finish in a global launch 60 countries in less than a year and actually we got live in the us which was our biggest market in eight months in which was from initial design business case sign off all the way through which was quite rapid mm. and then also we did similar within third party risk where we got a tool up and running within four months but that was very much because we had full buy-in from the execs it, there was a burning platform for different reasons on both solutions and therefore all the obstacles were removed where i think quite often even though we think we've got alignment because we've had business case sign off, et cetera, you do have different drivers. You do, as I said, you have a lot of legacy in most organizations and therefore you have to try and work around that legacy and how do I enable these things together and yeah. make sure it's it's also supporting future future strategy as well. Um, so procurement can't sit in a kind of isolated bubble within this environment and it's really having those key relationships and getting the exec and particularly I guess the technology um, partners buy into what those solutions look like and the impact they're going to have. In procurement how do we get the right balance between risk mitigation and agility? So I think the key thing is segmentation so I think it's mm. really there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach and so really looking at my Sort of critical high medium low risk and actually how do i look at the inherent risk of our organization because what i need to be focused on and what the key risk experts in our organization to be focused on is that top 10 percent because that's yeah. really where that's really what is going to drive the organization and, and i think quite often people can have a little bit to one size fits all because their argument would be well this provider of x can also stop the organization it's not untrue, but the the, the possibility of that happening yeah. is diminished and it's how do you mitigate some of that. So I'm certainly not saying you don't look at risk in those areas, but it's all about balancing, uh, being able to see the wood for the trees as much as anything else, that you really can see these are the critical issues in our organisation. If we can control this 10%, we have a high likelihood of success. And I think based on that, that creates a level of agility within the organization because the 90%, actually it's all about making it as effective and as efficient as possible. How do we manage risk, but how do we make sure that we're driving that through? And I think, as I talked about in previous organization, we did that very well, where we used to manage cycle time of our TPRM process, literally down to the ground. And we had the whole process from inherent risk through to supplier risk through to risk assessment down to about nine days which was a, wow. a fairly rapid process so it was always mm. quicker than our contracting process and as a result it was never seen as any sort of obstacle within the organization so i think it's really just trying to look and and also it, uh, taking your point on digitization what can you automate because a lot of yeah. what you do in risk processes are rules based and so actually how do we use rules how do we use different algorithms in order to be able to drive that through because again we have a finite number of people it's number it's often people that are the bottleneck so yeah. actually the more that we can drive things through without as touch well being as touchless as possible then actually we start to drive more agility into the process and as i said i actually think it's not just about the agility. I actually think you get a better risk output because you're mm. focusing key, highly specialized, trained individuals on the right areas, not getting them to try and cover everything and then not doing a very good job. So it's, a, it's the jack of all trades, master of none type <laughs> scenario. 
Yeah, it's, it's a great point, actually. And I think, yeah, a lot of people may miss that. The the quality improves when you when you focus a bit more. My background's IT procurement. You see in, in the cybersecurity area, if everyone tries to apply the same brush to every supplier, regardless of what they're doing, then you don't do such a, a good job on, on some of the more risky things. And you do, you slow down everything else, which, uh, which causes frustration and people just want to try and find a way around it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, what's the one thing you want your CEO to know about procurement? Whatever it is, whatever are their priorities and how do we meet them? I think that's the, I think the critical thing is what keeps him or her up at night and how are we dealing with that and how are we proactively developing solutions? So, so a good example, probably in, in Santander is the, and I guess all been in the public domain, we, we've had some pretty aggressive cost targets based on driving a, a different organization for the future. But the reality is, where do I talk to Exco and the board the most? It's more focused around risk. It's more focused mm. around responsible procurement. So it's really about what are those key drivers for the organization? What are the Exco's priorities and making sure that they are fully aligned? And I know a lot of people say it and we all it's the obvious <laughs> thing. Everybody will always say, well, I focus on business strategy and then I drive my procurement strategy think if we're honest what actually happens in organizations is slightly different because mm. i do think sometimes um we as a procurement organization taking that bandwagon jumping try and drive what we think the agenda should be and where we think mm. procurement should be going but the problem with that is if you've got a an organization where you don't have the same priorities and they don't necessarily think that what we're driving and new singing, all, all singing, all dancing, new tools are exactly what they need as an organization. They'll never really land properly, taking yeah. the point earlier around solving those business problems. And so I think it's really important. And I'm, what I'm not saying is that we should go back to being subservient and we do what the business says, because that's, that's absolutely not where I am. But I think you have to get that alignment and you have to, what, yeah. what am I going to be famous for? How am I going to get credibility in this organization? Then go drive the agenda to a higher level based on how we can really drive a broad value proposition. But you need to get those hygiene factors of what am I great at? Why, why am I in this room in the first place? And why am I delivering great value, whatever value looks like to your CEO? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you want a procurement strategy that, that aligns with the organizational strategy otherwise you you, know, you do you... but and, and and everybody will always say this i'm sure every single podcast you'll ever have people will say that i honestly think if people look in the mirror and say are we totally yeah. aligned i think it's slightly different sometimes because i think yeah, yeah. we we as i said we we like to jump on that bandwagon and whether that's and i'm certainly not saying these things aren't important but whether that's risk after covid whether that's esg or, or whatever that would be all of these are important but they have to be important in your business and mm. if they're not and think a, a great example is savings where everybody yeah, will yeah. always talk savings down if you're a massively low margin business just about to go through high inflation for the next two years in a very different difficult economic environment you better be really good at delivering numbers because mm. that's what your ceo needs and i don't think we should necessarily beat ourselves up sometimes that numbers are important. I'm not, it shouldn't be the be all and end all of what we're about, but mm. actually there is a the time and a place where actually it'll be really important. How do you help your team to focus on the right stuff? So I tend to, because I guess I like the transformation piece and I have posted this before, I guess the way I work is around, I like to probably think very big, make sure you get stuff done and, and kind of have an enjoyment factor in there. And I think that thinking big is you get people focusing on those big elements because these are the key things that we need to happen. Hmm. And I think if you spoke to some of teams who've worked for me, I guess the challenge I probably create for them is I often want to do everything all together. So you end up with a, <laughs> a bit of a prioritization. But if you actually break it down, there's probably three or four key priorities that whether it's the new tech, whether it's a new operating model, whether it's, a, as I said, delivery, whether it's third party risk, these are the critical things we have to get right. And I think it's really focusing the attention on 
on those big elements and actually where do people focus the time and and what does good look like and how do we sort of measure success when you're recruiting a team what what is it you're looking for in your team so i think i talked t- touched on earlier and, and this is not because i think i'm like it but i just think it's a very good trait in procurement it's that curiosity and problem solving so i think mm. being curious is one thing and i think it's a great trait to have but being curious and then saying well i find the problem but not being able to solve that doesn't really help anyone. So it's putting that curiosity and problem solving together. I think having that natural commerciality, I think um, being able to think about commercial scenarios and actually how can I drive commercial value here? Hmm. I think clearly coming back to the problem solving and and, uh, curiosity piece, uh, the influencing and actually how can I then drive that within how do I take people with me and how can I drive the solutions mm. and I think the last one which I think really probably resonated with with me more and more over the years and not necessarily just because there's a lot more discussion on it but it really is around diversity and and not yeah. just diversity of the diversity in every way really in terms of personalities in terms of how you operate I think I said earlier that I'm sort of high on that stress and performance curve to the right if you recruited 100 of me, (laughs) you would have absolute chaos. And so in certain roles, I tend to almost deliberately want to have the polar opposite. I need somebody around me who adds a lot of structure and rigor to what we're doing, because otherwise I can create all sorts of chaos for everyone. So I think really trying to think about the team, you, you always want the best people, but thinking about the balance of the team and how does that all fit together? So I've always been quite big on whether it be Myers Briggs insights, but really yeah, when yeah. we when we have formed the teams together, looking at what we've created and and how much have we just created recruitment by type and actually how much have we got the diversity and how do we start to use that across the organization? Yeah, I think that's key. I mean, you see it in some of the big tech organizations where you know, you've got like a, a visionary and, a, and an executor and it's you either just chat about what you can do and, and not get on with it or or you'll just be crazy just to, trying to do too much and not actually thinking about the direction you're going in. It's- Which is basically where I am. It's, it's I'm sort of very on that red and yellow, literally off mm. the scale, red and yellow, which obviously then you need the blues and greens around you to put yeah, structure, yeah. to make sure you're always focusing on the people because we've all got blind spots and it's certainly not that I can't do the, the data piece and that I can't do the people piece, but your natural instincts is very much around the vision and driving yeah. that vision forward. And so it's really, how do I, how do I then supplement those blind spots that I may have with great people around me who can tap me on the shoulder now and again and say, I'm not sure this is quite going to work because of X, because um, ultimately we all do have those blind spots. And I think the key thing is we recognize them and surround ourselves with great people who can, compensate for us yeah totally the, the skills you mentioned were they were traditionally thought of as more soft skills uh, so, so things like you know the influencing and um yep. problem solving curiosity that type of thing do you see that the technical skills are less important in procurement now or is it just that they're sort of a given that people can can run those technical skills I kind of take it as a given to be honest mm-hmm. and i think the more and more as we digitize further and i mean really digitize in terms of As I said earlier, even with my brain, I can work out how we're going to automate even further some of the sourcing processes. I can work out how we're going to automate further some of the negotiation process over and above some of the tools that are already out there currently. And so the role will evolve. And I've always kind of said to my teams, you shouldn't see that as any sort of negative. You should see it as a massive opportunity because all we're doing is changing fundamentally changing what the role of procurement is is and the influence that we can have and the way I've kind of always tried to describe it is in particularly in category teams you're paying people for a brain and a personality and that's what I want you to use is your brain and your personality and sitting on a laptop all day or sitting there looking at spreadsheets or sitting there running RFPs isn't necessarily using those elements so how do I make that as limited time as possible which actually means that you can really drive value through actually conversations with stakeholders conversations with suppliers and really start to drive it so i think um it's a given that you've got to have some of those skills i think and and 
I would probably again describe them as hygiene factors. You kind of assume yeah. that people can do, and and certainly when we were building the team, at, for example, at Santander, categories we did look into who's got what category experience. What we've got some real big things happening in tech, and we needed some strong tech category background. But it was almost a given that I know that you know software, and I want you to come and do yeah, that. Yeah. But actually, how can you influence and how can you really drive that? Um, mm. Was kind of one of a, a fundamental. Okay, and what do you see the future holding for procurement? Uh, I think, well, as we sort of touched on there, really, I think it's an ongoing evolution. I think it's kind of automating that simple. To me, it's all about how do we create more and more headspace for people to be more effective. And as I said, even even over and above the tools that are there today, you can certainly see within ten years where the sourcing platforms start to move to, where negotiation tools start to move forward and actually the importance of data. And so it's really about mm. how do we start to um how do we start to use that in order to, as I said, evolve what that role of procurement is. I think what I am a big believer in is kind of developing those operating models for the future and how yeah. those operating models will evolve. The, the importance, I'm, I'm kind of, the way I've described it before is kind of you are what you eat. And again, I do think we can be a bit contradictory sometimes as procurement leaders where we'll say the important things are supplier collaboration and we'll say the important things are risk. But if you actually look at how many people you have dedicated in your operating mm -hmm. models to those activities, they tend to be quite small sometimes. Yeah. And, and I think it's how do you evolve that of what is important to me in the future moving away from these supersonic category managers who we think can do everything because fin fundamentally they can't and taking the point earlier about diversity, people's brains aren't wired to do everything and to be the greatest no. influencer and the greatest data cruncher and the best supplier manager. So it's actually how do you then start to create operating models that really enable the technology and focus on what are the skills that we now need within the organization and making sure we've got the right number of resources in those areas. Yeah, totally. And in terms of that diversity, how do you think we can better get more talent into procurement and especially more diverse talent? I honestly think it's a bit of a misconception this. I, this is what mm. I, I, I get on a bit of a high horse on this one. <laughs> but I do think there's a lot of talent in procurement. And I do think as leaders, sometimes it's a bit of a cop out where people can always go on about a talent shortage. There are some very good people. I'm sure you know yeah, lots yeah. of good people. I've got mm. recruited lots of good people. It's all about selling the right story to entice them into it. You've got to what's that dream? What is the what are they what are you trying to create for them? Giving them the right positioning within the organization so you create interesting, challenging roles. Procurement is in a really interesting place where it touches pretty much every part of the organization. And so you yeah. you you don't see that in many other areas of the business, I guess, finance to a point you do, HR to a point you do, but we have multiple touch points, particularly in forward looking strategic activities. Yeah. And so it's all about how do we position people? How do we give them those opportunities and really sell the story of what it is we're trying to achieve and, and how they can have great careers and ultimately create that succession planning, create the career path. Yeah, yeah. So you're creating the next CPOs of, of tomorrow and, I've always said, and that's why doing this role actually from my first one as, as an interim has been quite interesting for me. I've always felt that if I do my role right, I almost make myself redundant because yes, totally. actually you drive the transformation. Mm. You've got great people having great conversations with senior leaders. And yes, I can continue that evolution and can continue to drive things forward. But the, the role evolves over time because you don't need to be involved in every conversation. Whereas day one of a transformation, you will look around and you have to be involved in lots of conversations because you don't have the right skills, you don't necessarily have the right people. But I don't think it's that we've got this huge shortage of possible talent in procurement. And, and I think it's it's about how do we then sell what procurement is, move away from this view of, well, it's buying. Well, no, it's not. And this is yeah, actually yeah. what it is. And how do we then start to really create um create our own future as opposed to sitting there moaning that we can't get talent which i think often <laughs> is the case the best talent is 
working on very rewarding strategic procurement work and they don't always want to leave you know that's the that's the uh, the thing isn't it and I, and I think it's giving them the, the breadth as well I do think um if you talk about sort of the specialism versus generalist I'm I'm a bit contradictory on it because I guess I do as I said I have recruited based on we need specialists in this particular area mm. but I'm the biggest generalist ever I've done seven different industries and yeah. seven companies I've done directs and indirects I would say I'm not an expert in anything but I can add value in everything it's kind yeah, of the yeah. way I would describe and so so it's it's giving people that breadth where you don't just because that person's a great IT procurement people person that doesn't mean they always have to stay in IT digital now covers pretty yeah. much every category every area so there's a lot of value there the same with marketing if you can understand return on investment and you can understand actually more of a commercial view about how I'm driving revenue that can be a lot of value in other areas as well so whereas it, whereas I think we can get a little bit too focus on they're a great IT procurement person so I'm going to keep them in IT procurement because they're doing an amazing job for me but it doesn't help their own development I think particularly if you're then getting into senior roles where people yeah, totally. want you to have more breadth yeah I mean I speak as a IT procurement person that's never really done much outside of IT procurement but uh but yeah yeah I think that's uh from, from a leadership point of view definitely you need to have that exposure into other other categories uh, what important truth about procurement do very few people agree with you on? I think it would be the piece that we just talked about. I think on this this talent piece, yeah. I honestly, I honestly think, um, well, the two things, I think two, two of the points I touched on, because I'm quite passionate about them, is I think, number one, there is, there is a lot of talent out there. I think we as leaders sometimes don't position it right. We don't sell the right story. And... When things aren't going right, it's very easy to say, but I just haven't got the right people. I can't get the right people as opposed to looking in a mirror sometimes. And yeah. I think that's more where we, what we should do. And, and also that piece around you are what you eat. Um, I'll go to lots of, com there's very few conferences we'll ever go to these days that says, let's all talk about category management and let's all talk about savings. Everyone will talk about risk. They'll talk about supply collaboration. They'll talk about digitization. You talk about ESG. But if you actually then go and ask people, how many people have you got dedicated to these activities? It is not the lion's share of their organization. They still have a, the lion's share of their organization focused on category management. And we've yeah, actually yeah. taken, and I'm certainly not saying I've got it right, but we've taken quite a brave view in that probably 40% of our team are focused on supplier collaboration, risk, and digital. Right. Um, and, and they're dedicated roles. They're not like they're focused where it's a part of my job they're 100 percent. that is their job um and totally focused on that even though we did have some aggressive targets to deliver we still felt actually this is the model we need to build for the future and this is how you create a long-term sustainable model so so i think as i said sometimes we can we can talk a good game when we all talk to each other because i think we're quite open <laughs> and, and there's lots of peer-to-peer -peer conversation going on yeah. I think once you start digging under the skin or like I have, and I guess like you do, you go into different organizations, what you actually see is quite different to what you expect sometimes. Yeah, totally. so, so I think probably a little bit more transparency, honesty, and <laughs> looking looking in the mirror and reflecting would, wouldn't be a bad thing sometimes. Uh, and if people want to get hold of you, where can they find you? Uh, so details are on LinkedIn and on I'm trying to get much better at making sure I'm always responding on LinkedIn. So I'm, I'm definitely getting better. Great. Well, thanks for joining us today. Oh, all right. Thanks, Rich. Good to talk to you.